Well, Joe, <laughs> it's a long book. But, but now we, you know, we've been kind of looking at the timeline. Now, now we stop and look at wisdom literature, right? And wisdom literature, when it comes to biblical theology, a wisdom literature has always been a challenge, hasn't it? I mean, how do you, how do you integrate wisdom literature into, your, into covenant or kingdom or, or whatever your theme is? Um, that, that's not easy. Um, I, I argue that it fits with God's kingship in that the wisdom literature is fundamentally about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is how we live under Yahweh's lordship. We live under Yahweh's kingship. We live under God's rule by fearing him. And, and, and we see that fear of the Lord in Job and Ecclesiastes and in Proverbs. It's woven into that literature. Now, I'll have to say something different, of course, about Song of Songs. And uh, we'll talk about the Psalms. So what does it look like in everyday life to live under God's lordship? Um, I like what Dempster says. Job tells us God rules the world but his rule is different from what we would expect. Wisdom, wisdom recognizes that life is complex and it defies simplistic answers. So monolithic answers that masquerade as wisdom are foolish. We are to trust the Lord even though we don't have all the answers. When I first went to seminary, I was 22 years old and I thought, I was young, I thought, I'm going to have every question I have answered at seminary. I am not going to have any questions about any verses after I'm done here. But actually, sometimes the more you study, the more questions you have. Of course, many things get answered. And the main, the main things are clear. But anybody who thinks they have all the answers, that's foolish, isn't it? Nobody has all the answers. That's not the way it works. So the, the prologue and epilogue of Job, we just, we'll look at big pictures. But, you know, we see, we see that Job is righteous, which doesn't mean he's perfect. He's blameless. Blameless doesn't mean perfect, does it? Blameless means he is a righteous person who offered sacrifices when he sinned. Zechariah 1.6, Zechariah and Elizabeth were blameless, walking in all the Lord's commandments. Luke's not saying they were sinless. Zechariah sins in that very chapter, doesn't he? So the curtains pulled back on heaven in these chapters. We, we find out something Job didn't know. Satan, very interesting. Satan is part of, part of the discussion in heaven. Isn't it fascinating? I mean, all, all kinds of questions there. But the, the narrator, the, 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 the person who told the story, He's not interested in explaining to us, like, why is Satan up there even? <laughs> what, what? I mean, there, there, there's, there's interesting questions. We could guess about it, but we're not told why he's there. But um, he is. And uh, we, we could relate this to Revelation later, and maybe I will. Anyway, we, we, Satan, Satan says, look, Job, to, to Yahweh, look, Job, Job's following you because he's got a cush life. <laughs> You've made his life great. And that's why, why he's following you. Job is bas basically a health, wealth, gospel man. <laughs> that's why everything's okay. So the Lord, the Lord, so here it is. We see the complexity of scripture, right? The, it isn't the Lord's idea per se for Job to be afflicted. It's Satan's idea, but God's sovereign over what Satan does, isn't he? Nothing, nothing, happens, nothing happens to Job apart from God's permission. I think permission is a fine word, God's will. And yet it's not God who does it, it's Satan who does it, who, who, that, who carries it out. The, 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 the ultimate cause and the intermediate causes are important, aren't they? God, God is the ultimate cause, but he's not the intermediary cause. And, and his motivations are different from Satan's motivations. So it's complex, isn't it? God's motivations for what's happening are quite different from Satan's motivations. Satan wants to destroy Job. God wants to strengthen him. 
Of course, Job passes the test in glowing colors, doesn't he? He praises God. We have another attack from Satan in chapter 2. This time Satan says, well, he's fine, fine, because nothing's happening to him personally. But you, 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 you make him, you make him uh, suffer physically, and uh, he'll, uh, he'll curse you. And again, he doesn't sin. Uh, remarkably, in, uh, in what he does. Um, we're, we're told, you know, very clearly Job's sufferings weren't due to his sin. The, and I mentioned the Lord's sovereignty. It speaks of all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Now, not directly. The intermediate cause is important. But finally, God's sovereign. So, um, God is sovereign over everything that happens, where the, where the dice lands. God's sovereign over that, Proverbs 16, 33. There's no random event, finally, in the universe. That's not the way the Hebrews thought about life, right? They thought about life as God is in control. The weather didn't operate apart from God's will. Uh, certainly, there are patterns that they saw, but God's, God's in control of what happens of everything that happens. There's no ultimate random event. At the end of the book, Job is restored. Of course, that doesn't mean it will be, always be such in this life. But ultimately, it will be well for the righteous. So, you know, Job teaches us an important lesson, doesn't it? One of the first lessons we learn, you know this very well, the, uh, the godly may suffer. You, maybe you've already suffered in, in remarkable ways, personally probably in a room this size, some of you have. And if you haven't, who knows what will happen in your life. Maybe you will suffer in profound ways in your family or your church or wherever you end up ministering. We, don't, we just don't know, do we? When, when we were in Minnesota, there was an there was a entertainment program on Sunday nights called Sunday Night Live, not Saturday Night Live, Sunday Night Live. It was a Christian entertainment thing. This is in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Anyway, the guy who'd put it on, he was a very gifted. He was, it was kind of song and some humorous things, and it was good. We went several times, and I didn't know, but he was a very, very charismatic. But he got, uh, non, I think it was not Hodgkin's lymphoma, or maybe it was Hodgkin's lymphoma. Anyway, he got cancer, and uh, he got very sick. And, uh, but he was very charismatic, so he was going to be healed. You know, I, I believe God heals, but you know, this is the kind of charismatic church that said God heals. God's going to heal you. And, if, and the only reason he's not healing you is if you don't have faith. So, but anyway, the doctor, my, our doctor at the church we went to, Bethlehem Baptist, he ended up seeing our doctor, with, you know, and he went in the hospital was put on a ventilator. I, like my doctor said, hey, if God's going to heal him, do you really need a ventilator? <laughs> so, um, no, you don't need a ventilator. God, God can heal without that. But it's the contradictions of an extreme charismatic theology. My favorite ever was in, when I was at Fuller in the late 80s. There was kind of a big healing movement going on. And one person told me, um, I've, got the, I've been healed of the flu, but I still have the symptoms. That was hilarious to me. So, yeah, that's how I get better, too. So, like, I still got it, but, I mean, I do believe God heals, but, I mean, that, what kind of story is that? Um, that is not, you are not healed. I mean, yeah, God's going to heal you eventually, but that's not a miraculous, instantaneous healing, is it? Anyway, I've gotten off the point. So, anyway, this, uh, this, um, this person went in the hospital. Uh, here, here's the sad thing about the theology. He was dying. I mean, it was obvious he was dying, right? He never said goodbye to his wife and kids. You know, in his early, in his 40s, young guy. How sad, how incredibly sad. I mean, that's really hard, isn't it? To die so young and not, but, but, but that's an important moment to say goodbye to your wife and kids. To, 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 to have some kind of remembrance to give them. Not everybody has that opportunity. We may die quickly, right? But he was dying slowly. He had a chance to say goodbye. And to, and to imprint something on them. But his church and his pastors kept telling him, you can't say that because it's lack of faith, <laughs> right? If you, say, if, you, if you say goodbye, you're saying you won't heal. But he died. Then he died. And my doctor said the two pastors, 
walked in after he died, and the doctor, who was a godly man, said, I wanted to say something meaningful to him. So he said, the Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, which comes from Job, of course. And you know what the pastor said? We don't believe that. <laughs> we don't believe that. How incredibly sad, you know? How incredibly sad. What, I, I don't even know who these guys were, but what terrible shepherds, right? What terrible shepherds of the flock. But, you know, Job, Job, Job says what they wouldn't say, right? Sometimes, sometimes people suffer. Anyway, what does Job go through? First of all, he says, I wish I were dead. I wish I, I wish I would have never lived. And so that's not wrong to say that, is it? I don't think Job is sitting and saying that. Sometimes life is hard. And it was really hard, and he says there are moments in a person's life where they say, I wish I weren't alive. He's not saying I'm going to kill myself. It's not right to commit suicide, is it? But he's just saying... Life is so difficult. I, I wish I would have never lived. Sometimes, you know, it may happen to all of us. Maybe we'll be 80 years old and basically we can't do anything. We feel miserable every day and we'd say, I wish I was dead. But God gives grace and strength, but it's not wrong. It's not wrong to say that. And the, but the friends say, well, look, Job, this is quite simple. You've sinned, and if you repent, you'll be restored. Job says, I want a court date with God. <laughs> Job says, I want a trial. But he says, look, I want to meet with God because I want to say, when I have this court day with God, I want to say, I, I, I shouldn't be suffering because I haven't done anything to warrant this suffering. Job's right, isn't he? He hasn't done anything that deserves the suffering. But Job says, here's the problem. I'm so scared of God. <laughs> I'm terrified of God. And he said, I want a court day, but if God wouldn't frighten me so much, I could say something in the courtroom. But when I get there, he terrifies me. I, I like what Von Rott says. Job asserts in the first place that he is unaware of having committed such a grievous sin as could explain the severity of his suffering. It is also clear that with this assertion, he is not intending to declare that he is absolutely sinless. That's a great statement. Exactly right. By the way, I don't agree with that. I don't know if you know Von Rott. Von Rott's historical critical. I mean, his view of the Old Testament is a mess. <laughs> but he's got some good theology. But you've got to sift through a lot of stuff, okay? When I, read, when I read a book like that, I just skip over that stuff. Like, um, okay, let's see. Let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> so. Job begins to realize that the wicked often prosper. And we see in the story, the more Job defends himself, the angrier his friends get, and the more they pronounce him to be a sinner. You know, it escalates the dialogues. By the end, they're saying, like, you're the worst person ever. You know, you wouldn't take care of orphans. You're just awful. Just boom, 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 boom. You know, like, what? they've just lost all touch with reality. All they want to do now is win their argument, it looks like. But Job, Job himself sins in what he says. You know, Job... Job is not suffering because he's sinful, and mainly what Job says about himself, that he's righteous, is correct. But Job crosses the line. Job crosses the line because he begins to say to God, what you've done to me is not fair. What you've done to me is not just. So Job, Job's a godly man, but he goes too far, doesn't he, in the book? He, he, he exceeds what he should say. Um, we see in chapter 8, true wisdom is fear of the Lord. It can't be discovered by human beings. There's no nicely packaged answer to suffering. Sometimes people suffer because they've sinned. But oftentimes, we have no idea why something happened. So my wife, you know, I preached on this Sunday. Maybe some of you were here, maybe not. But my wife almost died in 2012 in a bike accident. Why did that happen? I mean, for the glory of God, to strengthen our faith. But why did it happen in particular? Couldn't he have strengthened our faith another way? Yes, yes, yes. I didn't, I didn't even struggle with that. Just God's sovereign. God rules. God's in charge. I mean, I, you know, we're all different. I don't blame anybody if they say, why? Why did this happen? I understand. It's hard, you know, but that's just not something I ever struggled with because to me it was like, why not? <laughs> I, 
I, you know, I think I've read a lot about people suffering in the world, and compared to that, I feel like I've suffered very little. So when something like that happened, I didn't think, well, why, why, why? But some people do say, why, 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 and that's fine. That's fine to say that, right? But I, 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 I wasn't looking for some nicely neat, neat, neat packaged answer. Things, things happen, don't they? God's in charge. Yeah, Job looks back on the good old days fond, fondly. He ends his speeches and says, I was innocent. That Elihu's contribution, he's the hardest person to interpret in the book. He, Elihu gives me fits. You know, it's because some people say, well, what Elihu says is all right. Job's being disciplined for sin. But, I, but there he sounds like the friends. I mean, it, it, at times he just basically says, he's a, Job, you're a rebel. And I don't think that fits with the rest of the book. But then at times, uh, what Elihu says anticipates what God says. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure what to do with Elihu. But my solution is Elihu is partly right and partly wrong. And mo now, most people don't say that. People, most people either say he was all wrong or all right. And maybe those views are right. I don't. I, you know, it's... It's so interesting, isn't it, in reading this book that the narrator doesn't tell us what to think about Elihu. <laughs> he tells us what to think about the three friends. He tells us what to think of Job, but Elihu just hangs out there. <laughs> so what do we do with them? Well, we do our best, you know? People and do different things with them. So you, you know, he ends up saying like things like Job was a scoffer and rebellious, but he also says things like, God's so great, we don't fully understand it. So the book ends with God responding to Job. Job wanted to meet with God. He got his meeting, <laughs> right? The Lord, this is fascinating, right? The Lord questions Job. He goes, okay, tell me about the creation of the world. Have you ever commanded the dawn? Can you help me uh, tomorrow make sure morning happens? Do you understand the heights of the earth, the depths of the sea? Oh, by the way, Job, I could use some help on light and darkness with you. How about the weather, Job? Um, you know, whether it's rainy or snowy, cold or hot. What role do you play in all that? Could you help out? Do you lead the stars out at night, Job? Do you provide food for the lions and the ravens that no one else can see but me? Are you there when mountain goats and deer give birth? What about the freedom of the wild donkey and the strength of the wild ox or the speed and stupidity of the ostrich or the majesty and the bravery of the horse or the glory of the soaring eagle? And on and on it goes, right? What is, what is God saying to Job? Look, I understand the whole universe. I understand the mysteries of creation. What, what do you understand? So that's, so, so here's the fundamental complaint with Job, right? He can, Job is righteous, but he condemns God and defends his own righteousness. And jo Job ended up telling God how to run the world. And that's the sin we can fall into when we suffer. God forgives Job. But, you know, we begin to say to God, this isn't fair. Here's what you should do. Look, I mean, I, has this happened in our church? There was a person who was blind, almost totally blind in our church. I mean, man, that's tough, right? I haven't had to face that. I sympathize. I don't want to be quick to say, oh, that's, but then he, as he, it was, he was 70 to 75, he lost his sight entirely, and he basically said, I'm not going to go to church anymore, I'm not going to serve God, because my next door neighbor is doing great, and I'm doing terrible. Well, I understand in one sense, but in the other sense, you know, I don't know why you lost your sight, and that's, that's a really, really hard trial. I don't want to lose my sight, you know? None of us want, we don't want that to happen to ourselves. But um, you can't tell God how to run your life. You know, I mean, God, 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 God hasn't given a nice little formula what's going to happen to you. God's not saying if you serve him, you'll never lose your eyes. It's just not true. And so whatever God brings our way, we want to sympathize, but we want to say, you need to trust him. You need to give yourself to him. There's, there's no formula here. Um, 
Behemoth stands for the wildness and ferocity of the animal world. That's Dwayne Garrett. Dwayne is one of my colleagues. Dwayne's taught out here, hasn't he? Hasn't, didn't he do one of these weeks? Is that true? I thought he told me that once, but maybe that's not true. But Dwayne teaches Old Testament with us. Dwayne, Dwayne argues, and it's in my book, Dwayne argues he's not the only one. Robert File as well, that Leviathan stands for Satan. I don't, you know, is that tr a lot of people think it's just this, group, this is a creature in uh, like a crocodile or whatever. And, and maybe so, but the, I'm, I'm just reading you here what Garrett says. Much of this description, much of this could be taken as a hyperbolic description of the crocodile or whale. But further description makes even this interpretation unfeasible. Leviathan breathes fire. Eh, crocodiles don't do that, right? Smoke comes out of his nostrils and sparks fly when he sneezes. His breath can kindle coals. It is pointless to try to explain this as merely a metaphorical way of saying the Leviathan is ferocious. Every other fierce creature is described in terms that although sometimes exaggerated are nevertheless recognizable and within the realm of nature. Leviathan is supernatural. Leviathan is a dragon. Uh, Robert File in his book on Job says the same thing. So I really like what Garrett says. It's in my book, but I want to read it. God's answer to the whole issue is this. I'm the only one who can manage all the chaotic, chaotic forces of life and who can bring about the ultimate triumph of righteousness. And I know what I'm doing. If this has meant some suffering on your part, you must understand that this does not mean that I am unfair or that you have the right to challenge my justice. I will do what must be done to defeat Leviathan and all the powers of chaos and evil. This may sometimes require suffering on the part of the righteous, but I will bring all things to a just conclusion. Your role is simply to trust my wisdom and goodness. So, you know, Robert Files' book on Job, is this is the title, and I think it's a great title. Maybe it's, I don't know if the now's there, but now my eyes have seen you. That's what Job says. Job says, he's seen the king in his beauty, right? That's the title of my book. There it is. Now my eyes have seen you. When people are suffering, what they ultimately need is to meet God. A personal encounter with God. You know, the Arminian answer to the problem of evil is to say God's not sovereign, Right? The Arminian answer is to say, look, this happened because, you know, that car was going too fast and God just gives people free will. Sorry about that happening and God's grieving with you. And, uh, but, but, but I would say at the end of the day, that's not a great comfort anyway. Because if you lose a loved one in a car crash, you just want them back. <laughs> you know, it's not a great comfort to know, oh, that person was going too fast. Okay. But they're still dead, you know. You want them back. So I think the answer of Job is more profound. God's in control. And actually, I think people recognize this at an intuitive level. When suffering comes, people say, why God? Even unbelievers will say that. There's almost an intuitive sense, God could have stopped it. Of course he could have. He could have stopped it. He can do anything. And sometimes he does stop it, right? God could have done so, and what do we need? We need, we need to meet him. We need a relationship with him. The only thing that can strengthen us, and of course, there's still, I'm not saying there's not pain, there's pain and suffering, but what strengthens us in suffering is God himself, meeting God, an encounter with God, knowing God, loving God, fellowship with God. 